Okay, uh, good evening and good morning for those in Asia, uh, especially those in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> it's a very early morning, and I hope that uh, you are all safe and doing well, uh, despite all the challenges. So I'm Gyuk Shin, uh, Director of Schorenstein uh, Asia Pacific Research uh, Center uh, here at Stanford. I'm really happy to welcome you all to our seminar today uh, on the glass ceiling women and political power in Southeast Asia. Okay, this is part of a similar series that we offer this quarter on the theme of uh, negotiating women's rights and gender equality uh, in Asia. In this series, we are looking at women's rights and diversity and complexity of gender issues in contemporary Asia. So we have two more uh, left uh, for this quarter. And next one is on South Asia. Okay, one week uh, from today, uh, hopefully you, uh, you can join uh, in us as well. So today I'm very happy to uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Dan Emerson, uh, who leads our Southeast Asian program uh, at the center. So Dan will introduce our speaker and also moderate the panel. So once again, uh, welcome to our seminar today and hope you enjoy uh, today's panel discussions. So without a further ado, uh, Don. Thank you, Gilwok, I appreciate that introduction. And yes, this is part of a series. Um, uh, that's important to keep in mind uh, that we're, uh, as Gilwok explained, that we're, we're using during the quarter, namely to focus on uh, women and uh, the rights of women and uh, related issues uh, in the various countries and regions that are covered by by the Asia Pacific Research Center. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, I was facing a choice in organizing this webinar between scope and depth, and I I began to uh, indicate that the Gender Equality Index would have been a logical beginning for a statistical overview of the extent to which women in Southeast Asia, compared to women in uh, other regions of the world, enjoy various rights. That would have been a major exercise uh, and our time is limited. We only have about 60 minutes uh, of webinar plus about 30 minutes of, of Q and A. So instead of doing that, make a long story short, uh, I thought it would be better to zero in on a specific instance, not to go for scope, but to go for depth. Of all the countries in Southeast Asia, the one that ranks highest on the gender equality index is the Philippines. So it seemed to be appropriate to take the Philippines uh, as the example. Um, admittedly, of course, it doesn't represent the other countries in Southeast Asia. For example, Brunei uh, ranks the lowest of all of the 10 countries in Southeast Asia on the gender equality index. So there are differences country to country, no question about that. But what's interesting about the Philippines um, is that our speaker, whom I will introduce in just a minute, uh, is unique in several respects. One, uh, uh, she is a woman who has managed to achieve extraordinary prominence uh, and influence in a position that is not normally associated with women, namely the resolution of a very violent conflict in the southern part of the Philippines, which uh, she will uh, explain. Uh, uh, and I must say that without wishing to either demean my own gender or make other uh, emotional comments about the difference between one gender and another, which gets very, very dangerous uh, territory, let me, let me simply say that historically, if we look back over the history of violence, political violence, I'm talking about insurgencies against the state and the reprisals taken by the state against the insurgencies. Those activities tend to be conducted by men. I think that's a historical fact. In addition to that, when it comes to resolving those uh, violent uh, phenomena, it is typically the men who do the resolving, that is to, to do the negotiating between the state, for example, and the insurgents. Now that's presumably because the men have established uh, a far greater proportion of the positions of political power in the country, so they are naturally involved, perhaps representing the state, but perhaps not. In this case, uh, the speaker that I'm about to introduce <clears throat> uh, is just extraordinary insofar as she has been perhaps uh, of all of the negotiators of an end to uh, insurgent conflict against the state in, in countries around the world. She may in fact be unique uh, 
uh, insofar as she has led uh, a team under the auspices of uh, the presidency of the state of uh, uh, the government of uh, the Philippines to resolve uh, violence uh, in, uh, in her country, political, political violence, insurgency. Um, she is a professor of political science at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is a co-founder in 2020 of the Southeast Asian Network of Peace Negotiators and Mediators. She also advises the Global Network of Peace Builders. Her latest book, Region, Nation, and Homelands, analyzes discourses of resistance in Mindanao and Luzon. Miriam Coronel Ferrer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Don. Uh, I am very happy to join you and uh, the, the other participants for today's seminar. Uh, we know, of course, that this is going. This is happening at the time when we just finished our presidential election, and where we could have had our third women woman president. Uh, of uh, perhaps. Um, uh, perhaps really, you know, sort of really uh, going ahead of the field in terms of how many female executives, female uh, females have actually landed in top position of uh, the land, but that did not happen. And that's very unfortunate. And what makes it more unfortunate, in fact, is the fact that um, the, the front runner is, um, it, you know, represents a revival of uh, a Marcos regime, the Marcos dictatorship that we have, we've had uh, over uh, several decades until we overthrew it in, through People Power Revolution in 1986. So that's where we are. Uh, the politics is quite tough right now, but and and as in all politics, there are also gender dimensions to it. But I'd be happy to talk more about that, but let's see, we do want to get into some focus on uh, for today's discussion. Yeah, and of course that focus I think should be the outcome of the election. Uh, Sara Duterte, of course, one of the leading actors in the political drama, which has just been completed. So the timing of the seminar couldn't be better in that regard. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you would, if you don't mind, uh, perhaps apart from the gender dimension, but maybe including the gender dimension, I wonder if you'd comment on the results of the election and, and how you would interpret that outcome. Uh, there are many new things about this election. Uh, and uh, one of these is the fact that um, social media played a very, very big role. And I think that's one of the big advantage of uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr or whom we call Bongbong Bong Marcos, uh, the fact that he has actually heavily invested in it for several years, really uh, preparing for this electoral contest, while the second front runner who, has, uh, who is still our vice president right now, um, uh, really sort of was very hesitant and had, uh, had been busy as vice president. Uh, Bongbong Bong Marcos was not occupying any position in the last six years meant that the uh, BBM, as we call him, uh, had some kind of uh, added, really some kind of a lead uh, in, in this presidential race. And much of that was founded on a lot of false information as to what the Marcos regime was all about. So to a large extent, this election was about combating uh, fake news, combating misinformation, revisionist history on our, uh, on our experience under uh, a, a dictatorship. But uh, on a side note, you mentioned Sarah Duterte, and she will be the third female vice president of our country. And, and uh, gender-wise, of course, that reflects um, uh, something quantitatively. Uh, but then again, it's also true that, um, that uh, as we know, uh, a woman in power does not necessarily embody uh, that kind of uh, a feminist agenda, especially a radical feminist agenda. And when we talk about a radical feminist agenda, that's when we get the hardcore security issues that we will be talking about, especially with reference to uh, our internal conflicts. Um, in any case, it does represent something. The fact that voters are actually gender neutral, uh, but that doesn't mean that um, doesn't mean at all that uh, there is no sexism, misogyny, 
in uh, this electoral campaign, especially when you have so many women actually trying to, uh, to get into political power. Do we have, is it too early to have a breakdown of the vote uh, by gender? So we know no, how- but, uh, No, it's, well, we can if we do the stats because the results are out there and uh, I guess about 80 to 90% by now of the votes have been counted, but you'll have to look at it from province to province, city to, uh, city, to city. But there have already, there's already uh, some breakthroughs if you talk about first, like I think um, Quezon province, which is south of Manila, um, is having its first female governor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you do have contests uh, over positions where you actually have females competing. But indeed, as one study has shown in 2017, most of these people are the most of the women coming up into the forefront are actually what we call dynastic women. They belong to political dynasties, and this is part of the um, the particularities of our election now. The fact that we have imposed term limits precisely to allow more new entrants into the field, both at the local and national level, but the term limits have just been sort of uh, used as uh, musical chairs among political families. So if the husband already ended up uh, consuming all the allowable number of terms to be governor, which is three, three terms equal to nine years, then the next most likely candidate will be the wife. Uh, so that the power actually re re is retained in the position of the family or um, if, especially if, uh, you know, the, the children are young and therefore the wife is the most likely candidate. Um, yeah. So that's how it goes. Uh, it's this di dynasty driven uh, electoral politics. In one way, you can view it as a stepping stone for more women getting to power. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the big question of to what extent do women in power make a difference? Now, it doesn't mean that other women who did not rise from the ranks on their own um, on their own merit with or without the family name um, have not been assuming positions as well, um, nor those women who came from the dynastic families have not been doing quite well uh, because some of them uh, are. Uh, perhaps I'll give you the case of two, uh, Makati City, which is the financial district uh, of uh, uh, of the country, it's under the governorship. It's under the mayorship of uh, a woman who belongs to a political family, where the sister is also a member of the Congress. Um, but he actually, she actually competed in the last election with her brother. But it turns out now, based on feedback, that the woman, uh, the sister, is actually doing much better as mayor, and that's why. She won it hands down again in today's, uh, in yesterday's, I mean, in this week's election, uh, giving her another three year term. Um, but on the other hand, there's this island uh, called Dinagat um, in Mindanao, where you have a, a woman coming from a progressive left wing, left of center political party, uh, starting out as a party list, eventually being able to field local and national candidates who, who, who really did it on her own. Um, and uh, she faced very tough situation when the typhoon visited the island just a few months ago. And she did exhibit that kind of very good leadership as well. So, you know, the picture is mixed. It's good to a certain extent that women are getting there, but uh, going deeper, there's the kind of a mixed picture as to how much, uh, how well, in terms of political leadership, good governance they are doing, in terms of progressive policies, feminist policies, uh, there is a variation there and there's a lot more to be done on, on that count. Yeah, I guess, but, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. But if there's one thing in common among all of these women candidates, they all suffered from sexism, suffered from misogynist, um, you know, biases of the public, and you see that in social media. I think that's a common problem that all women face. I faced it as a government negotiator. I got very rude, crude comments on social media, memes that tried to demean you, 
memes that are intended to raise questions on your credibility because you are a woman. And the president herself actually said, the, our current president said that a woman is not fit for governance. And she, he was saying that in the light of her daughter, his daughter running for vice president. Yeah. And of course, our uh, Lenny Robredo running for president. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah, you're getting right at the heart of the problem. I guess I was thinking in terms of the, the evidence, which it may be too early uh, to get this evidence, but the evidence to, to, to suggest how women voted in, let's say, the presidential election. What proportion of the, the votes for Bong Bong were from women? Uh, what per percentage of the votes for Lenny Robredo were for her that came from women, right? Uh, uh, and do you have any yeah. feeling for that? Uh, and I say this in part, well, in terms of Sarah, uh, yes, uh, her father uh, is just been, from my point of view, absolutely outrageous. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> if Rodrigo Duterte were an American politician, oh my heavens, I mean, the things that he has said about women, which are just unrepeatable. I mean, they're absolutely, you know, he says these things and then in the audience you get laughter, but I'm never sure whether that's nervous laughter or laughter from men who, who agree with his, this objectivization of uh, the female body. It's just terrible. So do women, you know, vote their own as it were along gender lines or not? Uh, it's very going to be very hard to do that by just taking a look at the electoral outcomes because these are secret ballots and there are no demographics when you uh, when you put in your uh, ballot into the uh, machine, right? Uh, is, so there we exit, would, is there exit polling? Uh, not very systematic, okay. um, and I haven't heard of any specific report right now on on that. Uh, so we'll see, maybe the data will still come in uh, later on. But uh, voting, as I said, is generally gender neutral. A study made in 2017 of how, uh, how voters are responding to a, to a relative of a political dynasty, in whether the woman uh, relative is, uh, the, the relative is a woman or the relative is a man, it doesn't seem to, uh, it doesn't seem to have any significant statistical uh, difference. Uh, what is more important is the hold of the family. And then you, on a national scale, you have the geographic votes. Like, for instance, uh, the north, that's Marcos country. Mm -hmm. And a large part, that's where Marcos won. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have uh, a, a region in the south called the Bicol region, uh, which is hometown home region of Lenny Robredo and that's the that's probably the bulk of um, the provinces that actually um, uh, saw Lenny Robredo uh, the contender to Bongbong Marcos as uh, the number one winner in these places so these are these are also very mixed factor but for better or for worse as I said the gender vote doesn't seem to uh, be as pronounced mm -hmm. the fact that we've had uh, two female presidents, three, mm -hmm. three vice presidents, and we've had governors and mayors on, uh, on the range at the local level. I think the range is about 20 percent uh, at the national level, Senate and uh, the presidency. It goes up higher at about almost 30 percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so that's almost a quote, having a quota system of 30 percent, which we never had. I mean, we don't have a quota system, and we are achieving this yeah. uh, through just the fact that women, there's, a, there's has been a historical women's movement, the fact that we've democratized uh, our spaces, the fact that we do have discrimination laws that can be used, anti-harassment law, laws, um, a, a, a bill of rights that's very much entrenched in our constitutional history. Um, and it's a whole struggle for uh, for both democracy and also for women's rights that ha makes make these kind of things possible. But it's also the traditional politics that continues to be in place, um, largely running around uh, political clans uh, 
uh, dom dominating electoral politics, and therefore clans do have uh, in a bilateral network kinship network. Clans are big, mm -hmm. and there are men and women. Uh, uh, your your um, blood relations are counted on both sides. We don't discriminate. Uh, it's not in that sense. Uh, your relatives, both on your uh, father and mother side, are equally important, and and therefore uh, and therefore women in the family do get a chance only because the male in the family now has to give up a term, give up the position because of the term limits that have been imposed in our, in our constitution after dictatorship. There's a certain irony here, uh, if I may say so, at least from, from my perspective. The Philippines has been known uh, by analysts of Southeast Asia as one of the countries, perhaps of all the countries in Southeast Asia, the one that is, how can I put it, patron-client relations, mm -hmm. uh, patron-client relations. I remember in graduate school, my first exposure to reading about the Philippines compared with other countries. And it was really remarkable that the, the issue of patron-client relations was so obvious. It, it was sort of the structure on the basis of which, in some sense, Philippine society operated. Now, of course, there were equivalents elsewhere in Southeast Asia. I don't want to exaggerate. But uh, the irony here from the point of view of liberal democracy, uh, insofar as liberal democracy is focused on the rights of the individual, is that dynastic politics are not necessarily uh, you know, uh, guaranteed to produce uh, the finest leaders, right? Uh, blood it may be more powerful than gender in this case, which is good because there are women who can take advantage of their membership in a family, in a clan, uh, to obtain political power. But on the other hand, there's no guarantee that all of the members of that clan are equally qualified, and some of them may not be qualified at all uh, to take positions of, of power. So I, I wonder if you see the patron-client uh, factor, the clan factor, declining in the Philippines, and if so, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing from the point of view of gender equality and women running for office? Uh, no, uh, well, yes. Let me see, you have two questions there. But uh, in terms of patron-client framework, yes, that's because we do have a weak political system in this election, the political, I mean, political party system. And in this election, the political party system actually imploded uh, imploded because of factionalism, just about anybody created their new political parties. It's a very plural election. I mean, just take a look. The, part, the president's uh, party does not have a presidential candidate, does not have a presidential candidate. The daughter is not run, running under that political party, which in any case is divided into two, and the, com the commission election has yet to decide which one is the legitimate uh, faction. Uh, Marcos is running on uh, an unknown political party called Partito Federal Philippines, which is supposed to be uh, espousing federalism, but he has not articulated anything with regard to a potential shift to a federal system in the country. But historically speaking, in any case, there are reasons why the power bases uh, at the locality all the way up to the national are, are, are run around uh, along with precisely the dynastic ties and patron client, uh, patron essentially patron client ties with each families having their set of uh, uh, clientelist uh, clientelist networks, um, and that has to do with the fact that we started out very early under American tutelage in the early 1900s with local elections, where in local elections you have the political families, and eventually in the 1930s when uh, we had uh, the legislature set up, uh, then of course many of these local families just elevated themselves to get into the national institutions, whether it's a lower house or the upper house, and eventually stepping stone to the presidency. So it is that kind of um, uh, foothold of Polit uh, political power emanating from the locals with the families and the network of families that are aligned all the way up uh, to the national, especially if you have a very flappy uh, political party system, which you don't see in other parts of Southeast Asia. Somehow in terms of uh, the evolution of uh, 
uh, their uh, institutions, political institutions, starting as very late, in fact, because only after they achieved their colonial independence from colonial rule in the 1940s, 50s, uh, they eventually started out with uh, political parties. So you do have more established political parties in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, in, mm -hmm. in Malaysia, and uh, in, in Singapore, and maybe relatively speaking, even because uh, in the case of Thailand, uh, is a, a parliamentary system in the case of Thailand and Vietnam, of course, which is a, a still a, uh, under a social uh, uh, under the Communist Party, so we don't have we stand out as precisely not having that kind of uh, a stronger political party system, and um, and the power bases remain uh, uh, is maintained, sustained, and you may say stabilized through these networks of <laughs> of families that slug it out a very fluid. Uh, alignments across different families from local to to, to national. Ironically, that provides some stability, yeah. but is it good in the long run? Uh, maybe not necessarily so. It, as far as women are concerned, it provides a stepping stone because this is the reality. And how do we turn a bad thing into a good thing? That's still the challenge. I mean, Women's organizations, and we do have lots, uh, lots of women's organizations, um, they do have to work with legislators and they do find women legislators as the most receptive to some of the, to a lot of the agenda that they have been pushing and last, last um, this outgoing Congress, in fact, produced a lot of good Mesh, uh, a, a good of uh, a good number of laws that uh, are of importance to women, and that's usually uh, done through the initiative of uh, women's groups working with women's legislators, trying to get the support of a wider wider array of um, of legislators. Even if these women actually are essentially uh, representative not of women but of their clans, and not even of their political parties, for that matter. I wonder if you would, and I, I want to uh, get into a little bit what we can expect from uh, from the new from the new government. But before I do that, to what extent do you think there is, again, perhaps uh, ironically, uh, a partial answer to the question as to why women have done relatively well uh, in these terms uh, in the Philippines compared to other countries? Uh, that goes all the way back to the nature of colonialism in the two cases you mentioned, for example, Indonesia versus the Philippines. I mean, when the Dutch came into Indonesia, you know, eventually they created a state. And of course, there's this huge archipelago with lots of different ethnic groups and so forth. One might crudely say that historically, due to what the Dutch did, the state in a way came first. The Americans came into the Philippines uh, driven by notions of democracy that were very local in many respects. And so the introduction of democracy in the Philippines was not done at the top, uh, but rather in a way done out in the boondocks, out in the provinces, more or less at the bottom. Elections in, in effect were established sort of, well, I'm, I'm exaggerating, from the bottom up. And mm -hmm. that relative decentralization, if I can put it that way, of power may have opened up opportunities for women that the Dutch model would not have. Does that make any sense? Mm, yes, but of course, it was not until the 1930s when the women got the right to vote yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, right. in the country. Yeah. But the, yeah. the system is who has been there. And that's where we were taking off with all of these other uh, reforms that we have been put or we've tried to put in place, trying to precisely control patron client uh, relationships the influence of, uh, you know, the stranglehold of um, dynastic politics. The 1987 constitution coming from the Marcos dictatorship tried to respond to all of this uh, negative phenomena, but somehow the clans have found many ways to go around it precisely through the musical chairs. And that's what we were saying. It actually gave opportunity for women to come in because the patriarch couldn't stay in power any longer than nine years at the local of local governments. And therefore, uh, it had to go to another member of the family and the logical choice will be the wife. 
And if uh, that's not possible, then the children, if the sons are young, then it does go to the daughter or if the daughter is actually more, uh, more capable. And we've seen that in, uh, in a good number of families where the, 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 the daughter will be favored as against the son. Um, uh, but yes, uh, the colonial legacy is there. The fact that we've had early elections, two early elections when the bureaucracy was not fully stabilized, which meant that what we have is a very politis politicized bureaucracy and essentially a very weak state, a very weak state that's easily manipulated by whoever are those in power mm -hmm. uh, for, for all kinds of interest, whether from, from in terms of nepotism to all the rent-seeking activities to as, as uh, you know, what we, we saw in, uh, we are seeing in the form of cronyism at the highest level attached to the presidency. So all of this, all of this really uh, reflects uh, the kind of uh, weaknesses in our political institutions uh, that uh, where women are finding their political spaces, some progressive women, some conservative women, some feminists, Yes, we do have feminists in the Senate. We do have a feminist legislator now. Unfortunately, she did win a, a second seat um, coming from a left of center uh, political bloc. Um, and, and, and that happens. You have one or two coming in and that can make a difference. It's a starting point, but it's a long journey for yeah. that kind of institutional change to happen. Okay. I do want to get into your background with regard to uh, the MILF, uh, but before I do that, looking forward, can you make any projections as to what the new government, uh, in particular under under Bong Bong, uh, Ferdinand Marcos, uh, under the sun, um, will look like in terms of policy? And obviously, mm -hmm. one thing that I think many people who are uh, who are on this webinar would like to know. Uh, with regard to foreign policy, with regard to policy towards China, towards the United States, any any comments about what we can expect? Um, well, we know, of course, that even though traditionally we've had very uh, we on the security front, especially uh, the military alliance between uh, the U.S. and the Philippines has been the traditional relationship, and the senior. Marcos Sr., the father, really uh, relied a lot on, on that. But as we know, the U.S. also um, facilitated the exile of the Marcos family, right, until, until they were eventually allowed to return. But uh, there are cases, there were cases won in the U.S. courts uh, to be able to retrieve some of the ill-gotten wealth of, of the Marcoses, um, some expropriation that's been happening of their properties. Um, uh, but so in that sense, there is a resentment on the part of the Marcos family uh, against a resentment uh, of, the, of the US. And if you look at the, how they, the kinds of relationships that they build with China as power, the political power holders in Ilocos Norte, in the North, which is very close to China in the, in the North, right? Um, of course, Taiwan is also there. Um, they've actually intensified their uh, economic partnerships with, uh, with China at the local provincial level, where they have been the, the, the rulings, in, a lot of investments have come in. There's a consulate, Chinese consulate in, in the north. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means that they do are really starting off with very good, friendly economic relations with China. A Bong Bong presidency has that, has that already coming from, uh, from their local, uh, the, the way they run the local politics in their daily week um, at the provincial level. Um, and, and so we can imagine that kind of pivot to China that the, the, the last president, the, 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 the outgoing president has already initiated. We can imagine that continuing, um, uh, uh, maybe a good emphasis on the economic sphere, but then there's the big elephant question on with regard to South China Sea, right? Um, to what extent will this administration use the, the ruling in, uh, in the international tribunal that affirmed 
the easy rights of uh, the Philippines over some of these contested areas over China, um, to what extent will he use that as a leverage because the incumbent outgoing president did not. Mm -hmm. And what did, in the fear that it's going to antagonize China. And so what did we see? We actually saw China building up more fortifications in, in this part, harassing our fisher folk. Um, and only recently they did issue an apology for uh, using water hoses against our own Navy in our waters. Uh, so, uh, so in that, in, in to that extent, um, it's that difficult. It's it's going to be difficult for any president, uh, for any president, how to deal with China when it comes to its incursions in the in the West Philippine Sea, as we call this now. But uh, for Marcos, it's going to be transactional politics because that's what he knows. It's transactional politics rather than a more strategic view, really, on how we are shaping our foreign policy, um, and 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 all that. And if you look at it at the ASEAN level, we see these kinds of divisions as well. Among those who are more inclined to be pro-China, very hesitant to antagonize China, even with just a statement regarding uh, West Philippine Sea, uh, the South, the con contested area. Uh, in the South China Sea, and the Philippines just might be falling along in in that rank within the ASEAN, which is of course a very info, important tool by which we co can conduct our foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China. Yeah, right. Yeah, and my suspicion is I, that makes excellent sense to me. And my suspicion is that a transactional foreign policy on the part of the, of the Philippine government is not necessarily gonna be eagerly welcomed by uh, the American government. Uh, but on the other hand, there are divisions in the Philippines. One gets the sense that the security side uh, of the government, uh, I suppose understandably, is rather more sensitive to the encroachments uh, and to the claims of sovereignty that China is making for security reasons. And I wonder if those individuals will be replaced by Bang Bang uh, uh, with individuals that are more amenable to a soft line on China. We, we really, I guess we really don't know. No, uh, because we don't have an indication in terms of his own policies. Yeah. Uh, this campaign was marked by sheer absence of articulation of policy from uh, on his side. He, he did not join any of the debates where policy articulation was going to be pushed by those doing the uh, doing the interviews in in these rounds of debates that were conducted, he just boycotted these debates. Uh, so there is no articulation. But the sense is that he will probably rely on technocrats. You know the way the father actually uh, started out with uh, a very good slew of cabinet. Uh, ministers, because we shifted to parliamentary system, some kind of parliamentary system at the time, who were very technocratic in their orientation and did produce good policies. But as you know, most of their programs and designs have been uh, distorted by too much interference from the, from the Marcos family themselves, Imelda Marcos, for instance, who was interfering on the development plans, not only of Metro, as Metro Manila governor, but also of all these different cronies who got in, in, in the way of the technocratic plans. So, but I think his, um, his lack of expertise, lack of real grounding on men, the many issues that will fall on the lap of the president would mean that he will be relying increasingly on people who, are, who have the expertise, who will advise him and so on. And, uh, and uh, that's what we're waiting for, his list of uh, uh, people who will be coming. And there are, there are some lists, speculative lists going around, going around. But yeah, it's, it, I think his predisposition as well, on, uh, basically on this question of China will, will, uh, will provide the parameters. Um, you did say that there's still it's still, there's still some division because it's it was actually the military, the armed forces of the Philippines that sort of moderated uh, the anti-U.S. rhetoric of uh, Duterte because of their strong tradition. Traditional, I mean, they they get their training, they got their training, they got their weapons from U.S. and now getting weapons from a slew of other countries, including Russia, which we did. 
um, and 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 so on would mean you know subs uh, 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 requiring a new set of training skills for uh, for our military um, uh, and, and so on. I mean, a lot of our officers actually went to higher higher in West Point for higher education. Of course, Australia are also, is also one of the uh, more popular destinations now for uh, higher training for our military officers. But yeah, getting into that side of the equation, China, Russia, for instance, will uh, mean a significant um, retooling of our uh, security, um, security academic preparation, as well as uh, basic technical skills on uh, on some of the weaponries that might come in, uh, different from uh, the usual weaponries that they've uh, used uh, in in the past. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think at this point, if we could uh, shift uh, to the subject of your role uh, in resolving the insurgency, uh, insofar as one can say that it is resolved uh, in the Philippines. Um, I guess I would begin with the question, if you don't mind a little bit of autobiography, uh, how you got involved in the subject of uh, negotiating settlements uh, of this kind. It's so much, how I got involved is so much related to where we are now. I was part of the anti-Marcos dictatorship as a student, as a college student. I joined the underground. I joined the Communist Party. Really? And the Communist Party was uh, espousing uh, an armed struggle against the regime through the, its guerrilla arm the, called the New People's Army. Uh, but it was in 1986, after the People Power Revolution, when I realized that there has to be uh, a strategy shift within the Communist Party itself, given the democratic uh, space that had been opened up, the new constitution that provided a lot of parameters, um, in the, and, and even uh, allowed eventually for uh, left parties to actually join Congress, although again, they continue to remain in the minority. And that started my path to uh, the field of say, mediation and uh, political settlements, uh, including negotiations between the government and the Communist Party at the time. And as we know that there has been no uh, settlement, political settlement of that con conflict. The communist insurgency in the Philippines continues to be, is, has, is now labeled as the longest running communist mm -hmm. insurgency in the world. Mm -hmm. And no, guess what? I think it will gain from, it. this is a windfall for them. You have a lot of youth who actually uh, are very left in their politics and campaigned against the Marcos resurgence. And now they see a Marcos resurgence in place, and many of them just actually might become more radicalized. Uh, and it, but at that time in '86, the potential the potential was there. Maybe we lost the potential. I will. I don't think so. I think we still have a, a strong democratic rampart uh, in our politics, and that cannot be disregarded. I mean, it moderated the way the, the current president behaved. In the beginning, everybody was saying he will declare martial law. Well, he did in Mindanao uh, yeah. because of the uh, jihadist threat, uh, but he couldn't do it in the whole country. It doesn't didn't mean that he didn't try to do it. And that's because there's that kind of a fear that it will actually destabilize the whole administration. There is a developed democratic uh, block in the country um, and, and, and that's significant. I mean, you had 15 million voting for Lenny Robredo, 14 million, and that's 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 your count. That 14 million who didn't want the resurgence of a Marcos uh, uh, coming in. But in any case, going back, going back to 86, the 86 opened up possibilities for political negotiations, both with the Moro Liberation Fronts as well as the Communist insurgencies. And I thought that was a thread that had to be pursued, and that's when I left the Communist Party over debates on how to do the strategy, how to analyze the, the democratic space, how to analyze the Korea Kino regime who was uh, under threat from the right through the military coups that were happening from, uh, from uh, two segments of the military at the time. 
Uh, and I stayed on, and I stayed on, both in terms of my academic research, uh, my uh, civil society engagement, and also my global, global engagement in the field of uh, disarmament mm. and humanitarian law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, that's interesting. We go all the way back to, to the Communist Party. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Joel Rocamora is a, is a good friend of mine. I'm sure you know him very well. And I remember discussions with him uh, involving uh, all the debates within the party, some of them highly theoretical and so forth. So, so you made a shift, uh, not just in leaving that particular segment of the left, but then in taking on uh, a jihadi movement, uh, an Islamist movement. What was it that 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 I mean, what what was behind that particular shift? Did you become interested in conflicts in general and how to resolve them? And there was this conflict going on, and so it was a logical thing that you might want to look at and see if you could help resolve. Or was there some other uh, motivation? Oh, I was engaged as civil society in pushing government to actually be serious about the track uh, because. We have had six presidents. Not all presidents supported the peace policy. We had Arab Estrada coming from Fidel Ramos to forge the ceasefire, for instance, with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. The next president just broke it and waged again another war and, and created all of this displacement. During the time, we were number one in the, num- in the world with the highest number of internally displaced persons because the president chose to go back to war after forging after already forging a ceasefire agreement under the previous president. So it was in that context that I was a peace advocate coming from civil society. And then when you had uh, the former president, Noy Noy Aquino, coming in with, uh, with very open ideas about really finding a political settlement on, on this conflict with the more Islamic liberation front, uh, uh, because we were already visible out there in the field, both as academics and both as civil society leaders pushing for uh, uh, this, this track, this peace track, then we sort of got recruited. We sort of got into the government. So I moved from being civil society and actually engaging the MILF, the Islam, who happens to be a moderate Islamic group. And that's precisely the whole point get the moderates into this track and sort of uh, I, uh, you know, constrict the base for radical, by, uh, Islam, uh, more violent extremist movements to recruit. And in fact, if we didn't do that in 2014, you would have a much bigger serious problem of a lot of, um, uh, of um, people becoming more radical precisely because of greater disillusion with government, hopelessness about getting any good deal with, with government. In 2010, when we started out the negotiation, the MILF suffered a breakdown precisely because of that, the failure of the previous administration to forge a good deal. And you already were, were seeing these kind of breakdowns within their own ranks. Getting into a successful political process preempted that that kind of disintegration of this moderate black and preserve their hold over segments of uh, Muslim Mindanao that is now um, committed to seeing through this political process. I think that's the kind of uh, strategic value to this process. It's, if there's a justice issue, certainly, in terms of how we deal with our minorities, how we deal with people who have different identities national identities, a Bangsamoro identity as against a Filipino identity. Um, but there is also that kind of uh, strategic value to this whole process. And the president, previous president, and to a certain extent, the incumbent president appreciated that kind of uh, both the strategic value, President Aquino, the late President Aquino uh, appreciated the strategic value in terms of security, the threat of uh, uh, global jihadism, uh, really being able to expand in our uh, in these marshlands and forest 
of our southern, southern part of the country, but also the justice issue when it comes to really being able to do justice to our uh, brothers and sisters who belong to these historical uh, and uh, cultural uh, backgrounds. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it sounds simple, restrict the base, but surely that was very complicated in, in reality. I mean, and I remember the aftermath of 9-11 here in the United States. I suppose there must have been some who were arguing, you know, not restrict the base, uh, destroy the base. Uh, that is to say, to use force against uh, this jihadist movement, right? And am I right in thinking that your argument at the time was that would simply make things worse, or that that would, in, that would radicalize uh, Muslims who were not yet fully radicalized. I mean, how did you, I, I'm not, I'm not quite, sh I, you know, how did you go in and restrict the base? What did, what did that, what did that actually entail specifically? All right. Uh, it doesn't mean that the military wasn't used to run after some of the groups that are, were outright the outside of the loop of the MLF, like the Abu Sayyaf groups, for instance, uh, they did. And U.S. actually was more preoccupied with that than with our peace process. Mm. Um, they were more pre preoccupied at the time in uh, anti-terrorist uh, support for our government than actually being an active member in supporting these political negotiations. They, they didn't go against it, but yeah, they were not as engaged as, say, the European Union, Japan, or Australia were um, in the political process. Um, but yes, remember, nine, you mentioned 9-11. The MILF itself did not want to be a proscribed organization, to be listed as a terrorist organization, even though, in fact, it had al already opened up their uh, backyard to Al-Qaeda, first Al-Qaeda, even before ISIS. Now, of course, it's ISIS that's really sort of the, the franchise that these radical groups, uh, extremist radical groups um, want to get. Uh, but it was Al-Qaeda, they were inside. There, we had Jemaah Islamiyah, the regional version. Mm -hmm. uh, but the MILF made a strategic choice and that's what we credit them for. They in fact wrote President Bush at the time saying that they don't support terrorism. They invited the US to be more engaged in the process. Mm -hmm. the US sent the USIP but not on a very you know, uh, peripheral way in terms of involvement in the, in the negotiation process. And part of the deal with them at the time were, were a slew of security-related uh, memoranda signed between the government and the, um, the MILF that was meant to address criminality, which was a generic term that included the jihadist um, in the area where the MILF actually cooperated in, in, uh, mm -hmm. um, in restricting the base for them. In our negotiations, we had a good number of demands that not on the table, but in executive sessions that they do more about, about precisely mm -hmm. flushing out, flushing out these cells that are already inside. And they did, they supported, they did help. Um, uh, but they, it, but unfortunately, their reach is not as good as in the on the islands, in Sulu, for instance, where you have uh, serious problems still with the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, the the MILF uh, is stronger in the mainland part of Mindanao than on the islands. So that's where we saw the big difference in terms of how they have actually support cooperated in terms of flushing out some of the jihadist movements. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, Marawi happened in the mainland, but Marawi was a confluence of different groups, including groups from the islands and other parts of Mindanao, and not necessarily Muslim, just Muslim Mindanao. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how they operate, right? These are cells that open up from different parts, and then they sort of uh, coalesce in key moments. But yeah, Marawi was uh, a very unfortunate tragedy that happened. In your interactions with the MILF or with other Muslims uh, who were involved in some sense, either directly or indirectly or peripherally, um, in those interactions, did the fact that you are a woman help or hurt? Or was it neither? Mm, among Muslim women, it was positive. I had Muslim women, when we visited many of the communities, they would come up to me and and hug me, which they wouldn't do to a male mm. 
male uh, person uh, and tell me uh, we are proud of you. You show uh, you showed that a woman can do can do it. A woman can be in that position, and that's something that that is very hard, especially within their own cultural context, uh, which is more traditional in in that sense. Um, I, I won't say that uh, uh, traditional male politicians might have resistance to the idea, but they probably didn't show it much. The MILF initially resisted uh, my appointment as chair of the government panel, saying they don't know how to deal with a woman, that they will find it hard mm. uh, to negotiate with a woman because they don't quarrel with women, which right. is, of course, not true. They quarreled a lot. Uh, <laughs> We quarreled a lot. I mean, yeah, it yeah, takes two yeah. to quarrel, right? Uh, uh, but over uh, after some more, after some time, they they had to deal with the fact we they don't choose who's on the government side. We don't choose who's on the MILF side. Although uh, we did ask them to put more women in the room on their oh, side right. because we right. didn't have a lot of women in our room. We had two two to three women at the highest point, we had three women in our panel. Uh, three out of six were women in our panel. And not to mention our lawyers who were mostly female, our peace program officers, our sec the head of our secretariat was a female. So it was like really a female team, mm -hmm. female dominated team that we had from the government side and they had no woman on not their one. side. Not, at not all. one until the pressure was put on them, uh, not just from our side, from the international community, from uh, the women's organizations from the outside. So they eventually they had one or two women coming in as consultants, but they were very good women. They were very capable women. And we can see that increasingly they relied on uh, these women for a lot of the, you know, some of the heavy stuff when it comes to uh, because they were lawyers um, when it comes to really thinking out some of the uh, policies, some of the agenda. I mean, the slew of agenda, power sharing, uh, wealth sharing, or the whole range of agenda that were being negotiated on the table. Are there any lessons from your experience, which of course was unique to the Philippines, to a certain part of the Philippines, to a certain organization of uh, Islamists, but are there any lessons that you think might be appropriate for those in other countries that are dealing with, uh, if, if, you know, if I can use the phrase, roughly comparable insurgencies, lessons that you found that worked, and also uh, lessons from things you did that didn't work? Any, any, any kind of learning possibility, a learning transfer there at all? Well, first, of course, the, the whole idea of finding a political settlement where you might need to do all of these institutional reforms, meaning open up your own political system. And that's very important, say, in the case of Southern Thailand. I mean, to what extent, for instance, is the Thai government really ready to decentralize its political system? I mean, you have the whole democratic issue in the case of Thailand now, which still remains military dominated. Uh, but there's that specific issue in uh, Southern Thailand, which continues. But it's the political solution really lies in uh, some in major in coming up with major reforms on how it views security and how it views governance, especially when it comes to the periphery. So uh, that, that's the big question here. This is a political military security question. That's on the table. There are socioeconomic elements there, but it all comes down to what kind of uh, policies you will be adapting um, and how much ready you are to share power, share wealth to your peripheries. So that's a big lesson. The second lesson, of course, on the gender uh, front is that on the negotiating table, I think getting women there does have some impact, even if the woman is not necessarily feminist to begin with, but the fact that it's a woman, she will face a lot of pressure from other women. If you get have a good civil society uh, that's pushing all of this issue, if you have women's groups that are actually working for peace on the ground, they will push this issue and their natural, uh, natural ally will be the woman inside the room. 
And that woman will be in a lot of pressure to do that. So um, in the same way that I told you about the women legislators who had to carry the torch for the women's groups are carrying this uh, legislative reform that will uh, benefit more women, if, even if they were not coming from that kind of a, uh, a consciousness, a feminist consciousness, there will be burden on them, right? Because precisely they are women um, and they will have to be very defensive if they ignore uh, this kind of uh, natural constituency as a woman, which is your gender. Uh, it doesn't mean that some of them have not been, uh, have actually, um, it doesn't mean that all of them were fully receptive. No, but the pressure will be there, definitely. And the pressure will be felt by women because they are expected to carry the women's issues more than the men. And I'm sure that having women there, the issues will be sustained. It will not be dropped off on the negotiating table um, it becomes more of, uh, how do you say, it doesn't fall on the sideline. You talk about high, high, uh, very hardcore stuff, right? Power sharing, wealth sharing, mm -hmm. taxes, um, regulatory powers, um, uh, and all of that. But having more women inside the room, they will not drop the agenda. I, uh, include, especially given the fact that there will be pressure from the outside coming in that they don't they don't drop the agenda. And I'm particularly looking at the case of Southern Thailand, who are, a, a lot of women are doing the peace work on the ground, trying to bridge the communal divide between the Buddhists and the Muslims. And they are the ones really carrying the torch uh, in, in all of this. They might not be on the negotiating table, but they will be around the table. And that's very, very important to make sure uh, that uh, uh, their, the, the basic concerns that women articulate precisely because of their location in society and the way that they have been socialized, the impact on the children, the impact of, on the women uh, on, uh, of, the, of the conflict, the gender provisions that might get into political negotiations. Uh, you can expect that more women will be doing that than men uh, pushing all of these issues, whether they're inside the room or around the room. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I suppose an effort to explain it uh, is also uh, intriguing, but, but not easy to do. Um, I mean, one explanation might be, and again, uh, you know, one has to be very careful here uh, not, to, not to presume that, you know, the term female implies A, B, C, D, and the term male implies E, F, G, H, right? In other words, uh, to, to adopt an excessively binary view of the differences between men and women. But um, I, I remember uh, a, a piece that was uh, done by a colleague of mine here at Stanford, Frank Fukuyama, you may have seen it actually, uh, for foreign affairs in which uh, he, he basically took the notion out of uh, <laughs> the world of monkeys, of apes, right? Uh, where you have the alpha male, right? In the, in the forest establishing dominance uh, over the tribe, right? And, and played with that, transferred that into uh, human society uh, and, and suggested that there is a greater proclivity, proclivity for violence and so forth on the part, other things being equal, which of course they never are, but anyway, uh, on the part mm -hmm. of, of, of males. But then going on to make the point that in his judgment, therefore, the one sort of structural um, not exactly solution, but a way of alleviating that problem, ameliorating that, that, that problem is democracy. Because democracy provides the opportunity for a majority to check the alpha male, because the alpha male can only presumably dominate because of his strength, not because of his popularity. Now, you know, then we get into phenomena, you know, like, well, maybe like Bong Bong Marcos, certainly like Rodrigo uh, Duterte, also, for that matter, Donald Trump, right? Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, Frank was criticized uh, for making that transfer from the society of apes uh, to the society of human beings. What do you think of that argument? Ah. Uh... That's, that's a classic uh, view, right? Whether 
I mean, how do you ex explain the way the apes behave? Because they were wired, genetic, uh, wired to do that? Or was it also part of the mm. social context and the reproductive roles that they play, which is something you might not, cannot really be changed, change, although certainly there are many ways to go about, <laughs> there are different ways to go about reproduction now. Uh, but... Um, I mean, there's the context that uh, these, where these divisions have actually emerged. There's a context where these di divisions and imbalance in power relations between male and female are actually reinforced. And, and that's the whole feminist agenda, uh, whether it applies to the, to the feminist apes or, to, and, or not. But it's certainly um, there's a feminist agenda to restructure the whole power relationship in society, even in democracies. I mean, democracy per se does not provide equality for women right. uh, and um, at the family level nor at the societal level and uh, the political economic levels as well. So, um, so it, it, it's, it's something that and society do evolve, civilizations do evolve, which means that there's still a better arrangement out there as far as women are concerned, and that's the whole agenda. Uh, not so much because uh, of certain, um, uh, certain wirings that uh, were developed uh, through the evolution of uh, uh, the human species, uh, but, but certainly that, is, that, that can also contribute. That is certainly one factor. But I think the bigger factor is actually how the society has reproduced itself. It's a kind of uh, social roles that have been attributed for women, the stereotypical roles that have been attributed for women. And that's why it's so very important when you see women breaking the glass ceiling. But the whole, the the whole <laughs> challenge really is to remove the glass ceiling. Yeah. I mean, why do you need to keep breaking something when the, the right. if it shouldn't be there in the first place? Um, uh, I think that's that's the bigger agenda for for women. But every breaking of a glass ceiling uh, uh, contributes to that. Uh, a front runner might not be followed soon enough with a whole mass of women coming in, uh, but it does open up uh, uh, an avenue. It inspires other women, and that's why we have a loose group that we call WIW because it's true: women inspire women. Mm -hmm. Women who have actually broken glass ceilings uh, uh, sort of give confidence to women who have been nurtured to stay in the background, not to speak when the men are speaking, not to be visible even if they're there. Um, uh, that gives them confidence to, to sort of speak up, assert their presence, and make a difference in the conversation, in the dialogue, in the politics that's going on. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. I like the idea of removing the ceiling rather than simply, you know, cracking it, <laughs> trying to uh, trying to break it. I mean, it seems to me that that you know there. Let, let me just make a comparison between two ways, ostensibly, of removing the glass ceiling, and there there are other ways that I'm sure we can think of. And I, of course, I'm particularly interested in a Southeast Asian context, but uh, but also it applies, I suppose, to any country. You know, one one possibility is to reduce inequality of income, so that women are paid the same rate for the same work for the same time. Uh, that that that's a materialist explanation because it would give women economic power, and with that economic power, the values that women have, which again are diverse, I admit, uh, would then have a chance of being implemented to some greater to some greater extent. The other, the other approach, and there are others as well, of course, would be education. Now, in this case, perhaps, yes, partly the education of women, uh, insofar as their, their limited education has not sort of enabled them to aspire, right? Because they're not sufficiently aware of the opportunities and so forth, uh, perhaps, or simply closed off from them, uh, but also the education of men. Uh, to reorient their attitude with regard to the, what is appropriate for a woman to do. Uh, if you compare those two approaches or perhaps others that come to mind, are there any that seem particularly attractive or not attractive as ways of removing the ceiling? I think there, these are all valid arguments. I mean, compare South Asia with Southeast Asia. 
uh, economic opportunities. You don't see women in the market. You don't see, I mean, waiters. Uh, all, all of these, all the, all of these really, these jobs that require dealing with other people. They, they are mostly held by men. In Southeast Asia, where we even if we have a big, say, a Muslim uh, population, Indonesia, Malaysia, it's 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 not the case. Women are 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 taking on more jobs. In fact, um, uh, in fact, in in our case, for instance, especially in our case, um, you know, education has been predominated predominantly women now. Mm. In our university, for instance, they had to put a quota on women. Because so many more women are getting no. uh, slots in a very competitive okay. uh, free medical education at the at our school uh, college of medicine. Mm -hmm. um, now you have women dominating the fields of engineering in our our geology, which are traditionally uh, male dominated fields. So I mean, you start with universal education. Uh, there will still be societal biases, uh, whom to prioritize, especially for a poor family, whether they actually give the, the because even a free, free education public school system requires some expenses for travel allowances. We see that those kinds of things slowly, uh, uh, slowly um, dissolving has actually dissolved now where the, the male child will, in a poor family, the male child will be given the priority to to be educated, especially because of what we call feminization of overseas labor. So in fact, a lot of poor families now prefer to get their child, their daughters educated and be able to land a job overseas because so many more jobs have been mm -hmm. not necessarily good ones like household work or even the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the sex industry. But mm -hmm. the, there is now a lot of opportunities for women to get jobs abroad uh, with that kind of phenomenon that we've seen over the last decade uh, of overseas workers and a, a, a large bulk opening up to women. Our overseas uh, workers um, history started out with ma mostly male going out for mm -hmm. construction, constru mm -hmm. construction uh, uh, opportunities in the Middle East when Marcos at the time, the father, uh, opened up ties with our uh, Middle Eastern countries and there was uh, that kind of uh, huge build, build, build project in the Middle East. So men, male labor were sent over, but eventually it, just, it changed. The, 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 the landscape for overseas work changed and that encouraged a lot of families to give a premium for their daughters to be educated to land, and potentially land a job overseas for better or for worse because again of course the kinds of jobs that go to most women are also the kinds of jobs that uh, particularly expose them to serious uh, sexual harassment um, like very yeah. pr private spaces like uh, domestic health yes. or even in the service sector right uh, so so there's that kind of duality there you have the bad side but also the kind of good side in that in the sense that there are stepping stones for women getting out into the labor force and achieving that kind of economic independence that is very very important very yeah. important indeed so education and economic opportunities these are these are um these are big major uh, stepping stepping stones for women achieving autonomy Right. Autonomy, self-autonomy, and uh, maybe collective autonomy in 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 that in that regard. But that said, the the data is still bad. Um, most unpaid jobs, like in family-based uh, uh, jobs, are st still land on the lap of women. Statistically speaking, especially I, I'm getting figures from the Bank Samoro because we're also trying to track to what extent women's uh, situation has actually improved in that region under a new autonomous arrangement that came out of the political negotiations. I think it's still an up uphill climb, but certainly much better than what they had before. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Opportunities are open. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, I wish we could continue this, uh, but I think uh, we're pretty much out of time at this point. And uh, however, before, before we quit, I do want to say that this has been 
in many respects, a very encouraging conversation. Um, uh, I don't mean to exaggerate the positive and you know, minimize the negative. Uh, there are lots of negatives uh, involved here. You've mentioned some of them. The vulnerability of the women who go overseas and are working as domestic help uh, uh, and so forth. But the women who are paid for their labor overseas are sending remittances back to the Philippines. And of course, that's one of the unique characteristics of the Philippines. Well, not unique. Obviously, there are other countries that do the same thing. But it's particularly characteristic, it seems to me, of, uh, of the Philippine, uh, the larger Philippine economy. And once you're sending money back so that your family can do better and so forth, you have agency. You have agency. And you, yes, you have you have some power. Even uh, it may be you know relatively minor, you know compared to the power that Bong Bong is going to have uh, and now that now that he's uh, heading uh, the entire country. But I, but yeah, you know, looking back on our conversation, I am heartened, and maybe it's it's because after all, uh, as I said at the beginning, the Philippines is is at the top. Uh, at least uh, among the ASEAN states in terms of gender equality, even though there's a long way to go. So let me just end on that very, I think, encouraging and positive note. You've been extremely informative. I really appreciate that. Um, very kind of you. Uh, and uh, I wish you the very best, both in your capacity as a scholar, but also in your capacity as a negotiator. Uh, I wish you the very, very best. And, and thank you for, for joining the, the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don, and thank you to your uh, program for giving this opportunity as well for me to be able to sort of, you know, get a handle yeah. on these big questions that you're also grappling with as part of your uh, academic research and policy making. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And when the pandemic uh, allows, I hope I, I can look forward to seeing you in Manila. Or are you here in the Bay Area? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Take care. Yes, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.